In 1998, Christopher Nolan wrote, directed and shot his first film, Following, a rare debut in which a formidable creative personality seems to have sprung upon the scene fully developed. All of Nolan's abiding obsessions are in evidence, the non-linear chronology, the sense of identity and the unconscious focus on memory. Although Nolan's film is one which is appreciated by a small group of followers in comparison to his later mainstream work, it resembles nothing so much as a first draft of what would eventually become Nolan's Inception, a psychological heist movie in which the most valuable information exists when dealing with the subconscious. Nolan perfectly outlines his approach to filmmaking and sets up a career which has been consistently explored and rewatched. In this video, I'm going to be analysing some of the auteur traits and filmmaking tactics that Nolan used to plant a seed of what we would eventually see in examples on a bigger scale. This marks the beginning of my Christopher Nolan marathon, where I will be doing video essays on all of his films right the way through to Tenet, which releases this July. To stay up to date with all of this content, subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoy this video, remember to give it a like rating. Without further ado, let's begin the deep dive into Christopher Nolan's filmography with his 1998 film, Following. With his first film, Nolan's structure is a classic noir setup, as the movie begins with our protagonist, played by Jeremy Theobald, detained in police custody, recounting his fascinating tale of misery to a detective played by John Nolan, the uncle of Christopher Nolan. The young character we follow plays Bill, a unemployed aspiring writer who has recently taken to following random strangers around the streets of London, observing their lives and searching for inspiration. On a particular occasion, his current subject eventually notices him in a nearby restaurant. His name is Cobb, and he comes across as a weird kind of gentleman, but also a part-time burglar who claims to rob people less for his own benefit than to shake his victims from their self-satisfied consumerism. He famously says to Bill, you take it away, you show them what they had before going on to entertain him with his fascination over small details in which people store not their most valuable possessions, but their most personal ones. This idea is not too far away from Inception and its notion that by invading someone's dreams, one can steal their most private thoughts. Conveniently, in Nolan's first film, the espionage is practiced by another thief who happens to also be called Cobb just like Leonardo DiCaprio's character from Inception. The cob of following turns out not to mind being followed, and even urges Bill to continue doing it, which he happily agrees. That is how the young man finds himself helping Cobb in one of his burglaries, including an apartment littered with photographs of a blonde with whom he becomes attracted to. Already a trap has been put in place, but much like Bill, we are at a loss to understand the ultimate gain in this plan. Like Nolan's many other films, he puts you in a position in which the audience member is asking just as many questions as the protagonist. This comes from Nolan's consistent theme of the troubled main character. All of Nolan's leads have some kind of traumatic experience or event that has shaped them into the person they have become. They are usually defined by this trauma and have a particular set of skills that they will use while devoting their life to reconciling with the past. Although there is much to learn about Following's protagonist that we don't get much of in the 69 minute running time, the realistic nature of Bill's character and his reflection of Nolan's writing troubles is one that keeps a level of focus on his story. And not to mention the Batman door sign in the film, which I guess you could say is another seed of fascination towards the character which Nolan planted early on. I will be going into much more detail on Nolan's approach to the troubled protagonist in my Memento video later this week, as that film was very much geared towards this concept. 
But continuing our focus on following, Bill eventually seeks out the blonde, played by Lucy Russell, not letting on that they have met before. By the time he does this, the young man has significantly changed his appearance, not just by cutting his roughly styled hair, but also by changing his complete wardrobe for a dark suit, one which reminds you of the suits worn by Nolan. He is that rare filmmaker who dresses for production like a businessman. As Bill changes his clothes, his attitude changes too, and he becomes more confident of himself, almost like a completely different person. What we see here is one of the main auteur traits of Christopher Nolan. He always plays with time, whether it's the timeline of the story or the perception of time by the characters in the story. This includes non-linear timelines, flashbacks and time duration being manipulated in almost every single one of his films. He expects his audience to keep up with the timeline events and treats them as intelligent filmgoers that will catch up or figure out what is actually happening. In following, Nolan experiments with an even more complex and fragmented structure, dividing the action into four distinct temporalities restricted by a fifth timeline which includes the police interview at the start and the end of the film. He communicates this with the young man's changing appearance and uses a convoluted chronological structure through cross-cutting, combining scenes of Bill with long hair, short hair and facial bruises showing the before and after of a violent confrontation. As we move throughout the film, each narrative strand of the story catches up to another, with the film's full image beginning to take shape. This is how Nolan invades the mind of the audience and ultimately grabs their attention. I'd argue that without this narrative and time structure, the film would have been less interesting, but he uses the full capability of the neo-noir and crime genre to present the film in a compelling way. It sets up a long career of unique options to approach when tackling the concept of time, which when considering cinema itself is one of the most important aspects altogether. If you show the audience the end of the film at the beginning, they feel like they need to explore that time beforehand, because there would be so much detail that leads to a gripping and meaningful conclusion. It already places the idea in the audience's mind that they have to watch the full story unfold. In another director's hands, Following's narrative structure might have come across a little more than a gimmick designed to generate cheap suspense or take away the attention from the script. Although Nolan created an alternative version of the film, re-edited in chronological order as a bonus for an earlier DVD edition, this version of Following lacks its creator's beautifully articulated feel for the subconscious. Nolan films stories the way we often tell them to one another, but we rarely see them in the cinema. This involves beginning the story in one particular way, then remembering some crucial detail that was missed. And while he is not the only modern filmmaker to approach the workings of the mind, few of them have pushed so far in this direction within the constructs of mainstream commercial cinema. I personally think this comes from not just Nolan's fascination with the mind and giving audiences something different, but of course his extreme focus on filmmaking in general. In following, Nolan acted as the principal photographer while writing and filming the entire project. He has famously said in many interviews that he likes to be an expert in all the different roles of a production on a given film to the point where he's not an expert and he gains some intelligent insight from the crew he works with. With his first film, he saw this as a learning experience, while at the same time firmly planting his foot in the filmmaking landscape, showing that he's multi-talented and can be trusted with the keys to a big budget franchise or original film. Carrying this mindset throughout his career post-following has allowed a focus to be placed on each individual film as a separate project, which requires the full amount of effort and attention amongst all the people working on the production. But in the midst of all of this, Nolan tends to work around people he's comfortable with. Examples include his long-term wife and producer, Emma Thomas, 
score composer David Julian and actor John Nolan. He applies this approach more extensively in his bigger films, but the intention was there straight from the get-go, surrounding himself with those who will bring something to the creativity already outlined in the script. The brilliance of following, however, is that Nolan made the film with a restricted budget of 6,000 US dollars and only a couple of weekends of principal photography. This shows us that he's a quick and adaptive filmmaker who truly understands the landscape he works in. To revisit following today is at least in part to be surprised at how rapidly Nolan has risen from his barebone beginnings to the very top of the blockbuster food chain, and how he's managed to do this without compromising his original vision. He creates intellectual blockbusters that expand the demands of audiences' intelligence and their attention span, all while supporting pure filmmaking in a digital era. He does so as a private figure that keeps the precise details of his filmography close to the chest. It's irresistible to wonder whether following is a snapshot of who Nolan himself may have been at that particular moment in his life, perhaps as a easily influenced young artist seeking experience or an already keen student of human behaviour whose well-developed plans allowed no room for error. I think it's a bit of both. As following arrives at its final image of a unpunished cob disappearing into the blur of a crowd, it's tempting to ponder on the idea that the character is vanishing into the space of the young man's imagination. This is where that imagination starts to come to the front line of Christopher Nolan's filmography. Let me know down below what you thought of Nolan's first film and anything you find interesting about the director's beginnings. My next video in this Christopher Nolan marathon continues with Memento, his first main studio film which tells us a lot about how Nolan likes to focus on the troubled protagonist. This video will be coming later this week alongside much more content on his extended body of work. To stay up to date with this series along with all the latest news on Tenet, then subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to give it a like rating. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.